Hi all, my name's Joe, and I like to talk about global events, which the major news outlets often gloss over. I do this using a simple 5WH format, where I quickly address, in no particular order, the who, what, where, when, why, and how of any given event. I hope this is enough to whet everyone's appetite, and give you something to talk about around the water cooler. Today I'll be talking about a development relating to one of my earlier pods. A few days ago, rebels in Ethiopia's Tigray province accepted a government ceasefire, in return for demands that the Ethiopian government prioritise the allocation of aid to their region. Tigray, and the neighbouring regions of Amhara and Afar, have been the battleground of a bloody insurgency come civil war since episode 8, which aired all the way ago in November 2020. As always, the normal caveats will apply. This isn't quite breaking news, but it is a newborn piece, so this is likely to be very fragile, and the podcast could age both quickly and badly. So, with that out of the way, we'll jump straight into the where. Where is Ethiopia? Well, Ethiopia is a large, landlocked country in the Horn of Africa. It's generally sparsely cultivated and supports a population of around 110 to 115 million people. It is surrounded, clockwise from the north, by Eritrea, Djibouti, Somalia, Kenya, South Sudan and Sudan. The country's capital and seat of government is Addis Ababa, which is located in the centre of the country, near the region where the, which locates the Great Rift Valley and several hundred kilometres south of Tigray. Tigray province itself is the northernmost state of the country. It's nestled up tight against the Eritrean border and it has Amhara province directly to the south of Tigray and Afar province borders both Tigray and Amhara to their east. So now we've settled down to find where we are in the world, what has actually happened? Well, the Ethiopian government unilaterally offered a ceasefire on the alleged basis that more aid was needed in the Tigray region um, as a sort of head-off to any worsening of the humanitarian disaster stemming from the conflict. The various Tigrayan rebel groups, primarily the TDF, more on them later, uh, accepted the ceasefire a day later. Now, I don't really want to do a blow-by-blow of the war, but I do think we need to understand a bit of the context of what's been going on. Bluntly, all major factions have been credibly accused of war crimes throughout the conflict. There are no good guys in this in this one. Specifically, both sides have been con- reported to have conducted mass detentions and abductions of, of ethnic groups other than the major ethnic group in that particular force, as well as multiple mass killings of civilians. Although I find it almost physically painful to split hairs on the matter, the killings do appear to have been ad hoc and somewhat disorganised. Generally, although somewhat large in scale, they've occurred when civilians have attempted to stand up to the new occupier of a region or directly resisting looting and theft by occupying forces. The sort of moral uh, justification for this behaviour appears to have been uh, insightful language uh, on behalf of the political leadership on both sides, with motivational speeches and rallies focusing rather more on the otherness of their opponents rather than any sort of merits to their own cause. Another heinous trend is a massive use of sexual violence by both sides um alongside the massacres this behavior appears to have been incited by you know uh, leadership rhetoric but the sc- sheer scale of the crisis suggests that not only is it sort of having a blind eye turned to it but seems to be actively encouraged and enabled by local commanders as a key part of their attempts to impose their will on the civilian populations some external monitors have also suggested this is indicative of genocidal behavior um I guess in some way intentionally targeting the purity of a given ethnic group's genetic sort of bloodline, um, which just adds a whole other dark dimension to what's already a pretty grim situation. Um, A conflict has also spilled over into neighbouring states at various points over the last 18 months, particularly Sudan and Somalia. Thankfully, these spillovers don't appear to have led to significant escalation, but they do demonstrate how easy it is for a civil war to stop being so civil. Rolling onto the ceasefire itself, uh, it's been supported internationally by the United Nations, the United States, the African Union, and China. I do find it interesting to see such a wide diversity of major powers supporting a cessation of hostilities. Generally, if you look at, for example, any given uh, vote on, say, the Security Council or something, there always seems to be one party who spoils everything. It's worth noting that Russia hasn't really got involved, but I guess they're busy. So it, it does seem interesting that no major power seems to have any infl- in, uh, interest in the conflict continuing somewhat unusual for this neck of the woods. The US Secretary of State Abe Lincoln said that the US urges all parties to build on this announcement to advance a negotiated and sustainable ceasefire, including necessary security arrangements. Tying immediately off of that comment regarding security, it's worth noting that despite the ceasefire having come into effect last week, 
uh, significant numbers of Ethiopian troops have still moved towards Tigray in that period. That said, the um, TDF, the local local rebel groups, don't seem to have been so fussed. Their press interaction relating to the movements of Ethiopian troops have been basically a shrug of the shoulders. So let, let's hope that this works. In terms of less what has happened and more what isn't happening, though, it is worth noting that despite the truce being notionally based upon the need for humanitarian aid, no such aid appears to have turned up in Tigray yet. And this is this you know, this absence is notable enough that Western media sources who generally aren't so fussed about, you know, people in Africa are commenting on it. So it's a, it's quite a significant you know, notable by its absence. I'll discuss why the absence might have happened later, and I think it's important that we bear in mind that, you know, incompetence is more likely than malice in a lot of cases. But yeah, we'll roll on to that later. We're gonna have a quick whiz through the who now. And this is somewhat complicated, particularly when I'm sort of straddling a position where I don't really just want to copy and paste from episode eight, but I also don't really want to lose our direction by going off down too many rabbit holes um, and also want you to know kind of what's going on. So as a quick heads up, broadly, we've got two factions, uh, the Ethiopian National Government's faction and the rebels who are fighting under a myriad of banners, the longest of which is the United Front of Ethiopian Federalist and Confederalist Forces, or the, let me get this right, the UFEFCF. The Ethiopian side consists of, broadly, the Ethiopian Armed Forces themselves, you know, National Army Air Force, I, mean, I guess a Navy, oh, no, no Navy, it's landlocked, silly me, and also a series of formally organised militias from other provinces, but most specifically, these forces are drawn from Afar and Amhara provinces, as the conflict has rolled over into those areas, so they've, you know, got a bit of added incentive to uh, pick up their rifles. We've also had uh, an incursion by Eritrean troops, which is interesting and not necessarily what I would have called when I recorded episode 8 and the Ethiopian side has generally been supported by the United Arab Emirates, Turkey and Iran. The UFEFCF catchy is based heavily around what was formerly known as the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front. This was a political movement that used to run Ethiopia before it migrated a bit closer to democracy where it's the ethnic nature of its support base meant that it could no longer command uh, national political power. This has since rebranded to the Decre uh, Tigrayan Defence Force, or TDF, which you'll have heard me referencing earlier, and I think obviously it's important not to confuse this with a world-famous endurance bike race. This core of the TDF has then been augmented by a pretty diverse array of local politico-military groups with long and complicated acronyms, generally with revolution and federation and Dem democratic front type names. We, we don't really need to get into the details of the ins and outs of this. However, the key thing I want to draw away from this is sort of twofold. Firstly, with the exception of periodic emergence of uh, Somali state resistance fighters, I do find it interesting to note that the rebel faction doesn't appear to have any support from outside of Ethiopia. When you look at, say, Afghanistan, where the Taliban receives support from Pakistan and Russia, uh, you see Syria, where every man and his dog is getting involved. You look at Ukraine before last month, where the Russians were absolutely definitely not supporting the Donbass rebels. Iraq had Iran again uh, providing weapons um, to the rebel groups and so forth. You know, rebellions quite often have external backers, and from what I've seen on open source and in the English language, I don't really see much for that here, which I do find interesting. The other thing I think we need to draw out of this while we're looking at the who is that when we're looking at trying to figure out why a bit later... Uh, it's worth noting that neither of these sides are homogenous. They all have a significant number of people that aren't necessarily within their formal chain of command, all of which are armed and all of which are a potential friction. So we'll play on that perhaps a little later. So we're now going to get onto a little bit of a timeline. I, I don't want to, as I said, go blow by blow, but I do think we need to sort of get a bit of a picture for what the conflict looked like leading up to, well, last week. The war officially started on the 3rd of November 2020, where Ethiopian regular forces moved into Tigray. They then launched a series of offensive actions, which culminated in the capital of Mekele, the uh, regional capital of Tigray, which they seized on the 28th of November 2020. This forced the, as was then the TPLF, to retreat and reorganise, and this eventually led to their rebranding as the TDF, which operated as an insurgency force in the mountains and rural areas surrounding Mekele. This process resulted in a conflict that was somewhat reminiscent of the Afghan conflict in the mid and late 2000s, 
various forces were fighting to maintain and seize control over a series of urban areas, with rural areas surrounding the small towns providing space for insurgent and conventional force manoeuvre, uh, with a position where conventional forces generally held the upper hand in firepower, insurgencies insurgents are obviously generally harder to, to fix, find, and, and generally target. If you want a bit more of a breakdown of the Ethiopian army's sort of conventional warfighting capability, uh, episode 8 has a quick rattle through that. Concurrently to this, in this early phase of operations, the Eritrean forces entered northern Tigray. Eritrea is one of the most locked-off countries on Earth in terms of like media penetration, especially again in English, so I've not really managed to find anything that gives any indication of what their objectives were, but the general consensus is whatever their objectives were, they committed a pretty large number of horrendous massacres against the civilian population. They were notionally on the side of Ethiopia, and the Ethiopian government doesn't appear to have taken any action against Eritrea, and given the history of the two countries, they're not a, they're not a pair of neighbours that see eye to eye. You know, if they were if they lived next to each other in houses, they'd be continually suing each other over who painted which side of the fence what. So I, I do find it a little bizarre that Ethiopia, you know, didn't get a bit stressed when Eritrean forces just sauntered over the border. But hey, fun and games, I guess. So this phase went on till sort of mid twenty twenty one. The Tigrayan Defence Force retook Mekele on the 28th of June, and a series of smaller towns in the same region fell shortly afterwards. Ethiopia's PN then called a ceasefire while the regular forces were on the back foot, but this didn't really seem to amount to much. And again, like ghosts into the night, the Eritrean forces seem, seem to have withdrawn from the region at this time, although again, there's not much in the way of formal records to say what they're up to. So, fun and games. So we see then a a bit of a stand down. The, despite the uh, Ethiopian regular forces sort of dialing down their efforts, uh, TDF then launched his offensive into Afar and Amhara. This resulted in the Ethiopian government calling in on other provinces to raise uh, sort of semi formal militias to support the army, and led to a, a process which sought to force the TDF back into Tigray. By late 2021, the war had shifted back onto a conventional footing with offensive and counter-offensives conducted by both sides. Again, reporting here is confused, but casualties appear to have been very heavy, and this culminated in an uneasy ceasefire on the 20th of December 2021, with the Ethiopian armed forces confirming they would halt their advances into Tigray, um, and major combat operations seem to have lapsed until we get to the meat of the episode. On March 24, 2022, uh, the Ethiopian government declared an indefinite humanitarian truce, and this was then accepted on the 25th of March. Um, obviously, it's now the end of March. By the time you're listening to this, it's the start of April. And not much seems to have happened. Uh, there, Not that I've seen any, we've been no public statements as to what the future of this ceasefire or truce looks like. As I alluded to earlier, there's been no aid arriving, and there don't appear to have been any, you know, dust-ups that would call the truce into question. So it does seem like we're all a bit in limbo, which actually conveniently rolls us into the why and the how as to what's led us to this situation, because this is where we can begin to figure out whether we think this is going to last more than about 15 minutes. So if you want a more complete breakdown again of what started the conflict, please go and listen to episode eight. It was recorded about a week after the conflict started, and obviously it's going to have dated somewhat because information changes over time. It'll give you a feeling for what finger on the pulse would have felt at that time. A very brief summary for us to work with here. The Tigray are, minor are a minority ethnic group which used to be politically dominant in Ethiopia. Following Ethiopia's somewhat uneasy transition to a more democratic political system, the ethnic Tigray and political groups lost their national position because they didn't have the, the support base, but did uh, maintain a political stranglehold on the ho home province. As you kind of expect if you've ever sort of studied these sort of events, transitions of power like this very rarely go smoothly. It's particularly difficult when the differences between the political parties are less political, left, right, good, bad, macroeconomic, and much more ethnic, because rather than having a difference of opinion, you've got a difference of us versus them. And these historical ethnic tensions appear to have been, if not the main, then certainly a significant contributor to the outbreak of the war, and probably the dominant contributor to the just the ease with which both sides have committed war crimes. So rolling onto the, onto the sort of pressures here, from what I've read so far, I'm inclined to give credence to the humanitarian situation being the main driving force between the ceasefire. So 
Tigray province has a population of approximately 6 million, of which close to half of them are facing famine and starvation. This is in addition to a, a separate issue of over 400,000 internally displaced persons sort of spilling away from the conflict. And yeah, it goes without saying that like both, both parties are having to deal with the crisis of half the population not being able to feed. Uh, ultimately, an army marches on its stomach, and if you can't feed the civilians, they can't provide you know, food for anyone fighting. It's a nightmare all round. This does appear to be a rod the government has made for its own back. They've essentially placed Tigray under siege. They've prevented trade or transport into the region as part of an effort to strangle the rebellion. But any sort of, you know, ham-fisted efforts like this have the predictable effect of strangling the population as well. The situation with shortages is not just lack of food, it's a lack of apparently pretty much everything. So reports on the ground at the moment are that aid workers are trying to deliver food and medicine on foot as they can't even fuel their vehicles. As such, this raises a very significant concern that even with the barriers notionally lifting, we're not going to see an improvement very quickly. So what we've got to think about here, as I mean, as, as Russia is beautifully demonstrating for us in Ukraine, um, that you can have, you know, X, Y, and Z. You can have, like, let's 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 pretend for a moment. Let's imagine that there's tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of tons of food ready to go into Tigray. Well, that's great, but there's not been fuel for months. So we've now got to use whatever logistic chain we have has to get fuel up for the vehicles, it has to bring spares up for the vehicles, it has to bring mechanics up for the vehicles, it has to restore the vehicles to working condition, it then has to put food in the vehicles and deliver them to the, well, for want of a better word, the client. So this, this is where I'm beginning to think that the lack of aid turning up in the region is not malice. I think we are going to face not only a humanitarian crisis, but also huge logistical hurdles in delivering aid to these people. So I do hope that, you know, as much as much effort can be uh, allocated to helping this as possible. Although I'm not obviously trying to say anything as, you know, good, bad or ugly about this. Um, we do need to take it into a bit of context. So, as I said, Tigray has a population of circa 6 million people, of which about half are facing food insecurity. So that's 3 million people. Um, Ethiopia as a whole has a population of 110 to 115 million with a total population of 9 million in need of food aid to survive. So this means that Tigray province has, excusing my quick maths, yeah, call it a 20th of the country's population, but a third of their malnourished and starving people. So although there are more starving people outside of Tigray, the concentration of this poverty in the region is immense. It is, you know, it's a order of magnitude different to the situation across the rest of the country. There does also appear to have been a bit of effort by outside parties to apply pressure uh, to lead towards a ceasefire. Um, the US did not sanction Ethiopia to try and cease the war, but it did remove trade privileges. Given that we've seen the effectiveness of sanctions both in triggering the initial Iran nuclear deal and also in, as we, as we watch, destroying the Russian economy, it could be easy to suggest that the US is being somewhat hypocritical by not taking similar actions against Ethiopia, which, I mean, I, I would get what you're saying, but my understanding of the economic situation, which admittedly is as a layperson on a computer, Ethiopia is less tied into the wider global trade, so there's probably a pretty slight difference between removing a few privileges and imposing sanctions is probably a significant amount of increased effort for not necessarily applying that much more pressure. Fundamentally, in the same way that sanctions don't really harm North Korea, sanctions aren't really going to affect any country that isn't tightly bound into the global commerce networks. I'm happy to be proven wrong on that, but that's that's my take on why the US didn't take more assertive action. We'll see how that goes. I'm sure there's more to it, but as a as a starter for 10. It's also worth noting that a lot of uh, other regional countries have become quite heavily involved in di diplomatic efforts. The African Union have conducted multiple rounds of peace talks, although in no cases do these seem to have led directly to any sort of ceasefires or degradation in the conflict. And they also don't appear to have given us any sort of roadmap for peace. As I said, this 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 piece was apparently unprompted on behalf of the Ethiopians. There, I mean, a U.S. special envoy did visit Ethiopia last uh, the week before the ceasefire, but there were no massive summits. There have been no announcements of any prototype political settlement or anything like that. So it's hard to say exactly what the effect of these peace talks have, has been. Obviously, I'm hopeful. Peace is always better than war, and this war is particularly unpleasant. But yeah, it it's. It does raise some concerns, actually, if I'm honest with you, because if we, I'm 
a sucker for a bit of Clausewitz here, war is an extension of politics by other means, and, and the inverse is true as well. You can't just end a conflict without a political settlement. So I'm concerned that at the moment, the economic survivability pressures are so great that neither side can maintain conflict in that environment. But without settling the underlying cause, once and if that crisis resolves itself or eases sufficiently, there's a genuine risk of war returning. The flip side, of course, of this is if they have a ceasefire and the, the sides cooperate to meaningfully aid their people, inevitably people will build relationships with each other and that might provide a framework for developing peace further. I guess I, I don't want to predict it going either way. I just really want to emphasise how until that political settlement is sort of advertised and put out there, this peace is going to be fragile. Yeah, it's concerning. Uh, and this is also probably the point where I just need to readdress uh, yeah, there have been extensive reports that Ethiopian forces have been reinforced around Tigray. Ethiopian officials have reported that these troop movements are part of routine rotations, you know, taking guys off the front line for a bit of R&R &R and that sort of thing. I mean, that is a thing that happens, you know, even in World War One, which we think of as a pretty horrendous full-on conflict. British troops were rotated away from the front line quite regularly, so that that's not unbelievable. But equally, I mean, if you're going to be distributing large amounts of food down limited supply roads in a population of starving people, you're going to need to protect that food if you want to distribute it effectively. You know, so th th there are good sides to this. Although, equally, we've had a couple of ceasefires in this conflict and it hasn't stopped it yet. So uh, I can't rule out that this ceasefire is just uh, one side or another, or the Ethiopian army side, because they declared the ceasefire, um, using it as a bit of an opportunity to rearm, square themselves away and prepare for offensive action. I hope I'm wrong. So yeah, I think that's probably enough to wrap up with. Probably enough for you to have your morning bagel and mull over. As I said at the start, this ceasefire is young, and it doesn't ap yet appear to have any deep political roots. I think what we all need to hope is that the ceasefire and its focus on aiding the population will provide a sufficient base of trust between the parties for a, a bit more meaningful of a political engagement. But until that happens, I am genuinely concerned that war will continue to loom in the background of Ethiopia and Tigray province for quite some time. So yeah, um, thank you for listening. If you've enjoyed listening, then please, on whatever platform you're using, whack, follow, subscribe, like, anything else, and come and join me on Facebook and Instagram. Just search 5WH or 5WH pod. I'd welcome your comments. I'll put stuff up on there that'll have a, you know give you a bit of an indication when the next posts are coming, give you a few hints on what's coming next, things like that. I, I really want to hear what you guys think. It's what makes it worthwhile. Otherwise, uh, cheers, thanks, and see you soon.